May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is the last verse of the Old Testament lesson, which was read earlier. I recall your attention to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 25, where God, the Lord, is speaking to us all. And he says to us, For I have satiated the weary soul, and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. So far the text. The name of Jesus, who as we read in the epistle lesson a moment ago, we have the free gift of eternal life in heaven forever. Dear fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true and only living, creating and preserving God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know what the news is today? especially in the state of Illinois, we're out of money. State's bankrupt. It's not unusual. We read that uh, Greece is also bankrupt. That's not unusual. I was talking to the mayor of Springfield a few months ago. He said the city of Springfield's bankrupt. The United States of America is over $18 trillion in debt. CIA warns of global economic collapse, almost beyond comprehension, blowing up a huge economic bubble of debt that will someday burst. So we got problems. On the one hand, they say, well, we've got economic problems and uh, therefore there isn't enough to go around. But on the other hand, they say, if there was enough to go around, the population would grow and we would have too many people and we'd pollute ourselves to death and consume ourselves to death. So there's no answer. And then we have the fact that uh, in the United States, we read the statistic, every year 1.4 million children run, run away from home. Suicide among teenagers and juveniles one of the leading causes of death. Uh, crime among juveniles is growing faster than the juvenile population. One out of every two marriages or more ends in divorce. Divorce in America, people in their late 20s, much more common now than it was 50 years ago. And that's even with the fact that most of them don't even get married anymore, they just cohabit. So there was a White House conference on children. And uh, surprise, surprise, they concluded that American families are in trouble. They went on to say that American families are in trouble so deep, I'm quoting, so deep and pervasive that it threatens the future of our nation. Unquote. Well, I've lived long enough to remember 
the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, growing up in those eras, when we were promised by the worldlings that once marriage became open, sex became free, abortion became legal, and divorce became nobody's fault, that we would all be happy. Well, we've got it all now, but most people, I don't think, are happy. Though they may act happy on the outside, when you get to really know people closely, you find that they are not happy, they are weary. They are tired. They are worn out with problems. To just know people from afar, they look like they're happy, like they have a shiny surface when you see them from a distance, but when you get close to them, you see it's only cheap, chipped paint. They want to be happy, they try to be happy, they put on a show of happiness, but inside, they are weary. It's like a journey in the hot sun, day after day. Why is that? Because of sin. Oh, they don't want to admit that, but that's what it is. This world was not meant to be this way. God did not create it this way. It's this way because of human sin. It has created a world not like the Garden of Eden, but like a hot desert. And as we travel through this hot desert of sin, we get weary. And not only are we weary, we get weak. We get weak because we are sinful. And not only is the world weary and weak, it is sad and sorrowful. The Bible's right when it calls this sin-filled world a veil of tears, a valley of tears, a valley of sadness, sorrow, sorrow over death, death of loved ones, sorrow over illnesses, illnesses in ourselves and illnesses in those close to us, sorrow over our mistakes, sorrow over our sins. A person once said, there is no happiness in this life. Happy is a children's word. A large part of human vocations and jobs and careers are, invi are involved in trying to alleviate human suffering. When you read the Bible, it reflects the sinful world and sad world we live in. For example, in the book of Psalms, there's 150 Psalms. Ninety of them are about suffering, pain, sadness, and sorrow. So are you weary and sad? I don't think so, because you have found relief. That's why you're here today. But you are the peculiar ones, the Bible says. You're the oddballs. Most people in this weariness and this sadness don't turn to God's word, don't turn to God. They turn to drugs. They turn to alcohol. Or something else. Would that the world did what you have done and turned to Jesus Christ. 
Because there alone, in Jesus Christ, God tells us, I have satiated the weary soul. That's the only place you can find rest. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In the Bible, Jesus Christ is pictured as a stream, I'm quoting here the Bible, a stream of water in a dry place. Like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Jesus is that one oasis in this desert of sin, this hot, long, wearisome journey. He is the stream and the rock and the oasis. There is none other. You will seek in vain for any other. Martin Luther did for many years. Martin Luther decided at a very young age he wanted to become a monk in the church. So he became a monk and he was taught as a monk that he was a sinful man and he must do penance. And so he did. He did what the church told him. And it drove him almost to the grave. Because the church taught him wrong. The church didn't teach him the Bible. It just taught him that he was a sinner and that he had to pay for these sins himself. He had to work these sins off himself. And he became severely sick. He lay in a cold cell on the floor. He had ruined his body through these penances. He had slept outside in the winter with hardly any clothes on. He had ravaged his body. It was to the point of sickness that was so severe, he was on the verge of death. And yet still he fasted because still he felt so guilty. He felt so sinful. He felt like, I've still got to do more to please God. I've still got to do more to, to ward off this guilt I feel this fear of death and hell that I feel. And so he fasted and prayed and he got sicker and sicker and he was that close to death. He was weary, as Jesus said, he labored and was heavy laden. Or as our text says, he was weary. He was a weary soul. And it goes on to say, I have replenished every sorrowful soul. He was also very sorrowful. Weary and sorrowful, Martin Luther, the young monk, laid on his cell floor almost near death. But then an old monk came in to his cell the last moment. And he just kept repeating to young Martin the words that we just spoke, the Apostles' Creed. And he kept repeating those words, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. And these words were like, Martin Luther later said it was like a drink of cold water to a man dying of thirst. Luther thought to himself, could there be, could there be forgiveness from God? Could God just forgive my sins? And he started studying the Bible. Instead of the teachings of the church, he started studying the Bible. And there he found that there is forgiveness with God. 
because God himself did the penance. God did the suffering. God did the dying. God came down from heaven. God the Father sent God the Son. The first person of the Trinity sent the second person of the Trinity into this desert of sin to live a sinless life and offer his precious, perfect, holy blood for the sins of the world. As John the Baptist said of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And so God says in Jesus Christ, I have satiated the weary soul. I have given it rest. And I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Come unto me, Jesus said. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's why you have come here today, isn't it? Because you know this is the only place. God's word in Jesus Christ that you will find rest in this horrible world that is filled with nothing but problems. And you have found the answer. That God has said, I have satiated the weary soul. I have replenished every sorrowful soul. There is no sinner anywhere that cannot find forgiveness with God through Jesus Christ. For Jesus died for all sins and for all sinners in their place. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And to prove this to the world, prove that Jesus is God, Jesus is our creator, that Jesus is our only Savior, he rose from the dead after he died for our sins. That's your proof. People were always asking Jesus, give us a sign, give us a sign. Give us a proof, prove it, that you are who you say you are. That in you we will find rest for our souls, in you we will find happiness and joy instead of sorrow. Give us some proof. And Jesus says, I'll give you one proof. The sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, and he came forth from his grave. And Jesus says, that's your proof. I will rise from the dead on the third day. And so he did. And so he showed himself alive to over 500 witnesses. And we have their witness in the Bible. It's true. But God says he hurt. Jesus has proved, I have satiated the weary soul. I have replenished every sorrowful soul. God sees Jesus Christ, and God is satisfied. All of our sins are paid. And therefore, he forgives us all our sins. The sinner sees Jesus Christ, and he is satisfied. I have satiated the weary soul. When Luther found out about Jesus dying for his sins, then Luther was satisfied. His weary soul was satiated. Your sin, which is great, is like a drop of water to the ocean compared to the price that Jesus paid for your sin. 
Jesus paid the infinite price, the price of God himself. Much greater than our sins. Never doubt that in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Never doubt that Christ's sacrifice on the cross was big enough to get you to heaven. Keep your eyes on his cross. The price that Jesus Christ, God the Son, paid was enormous. Much more than you can ever imagine. Certainly enough to pay for your sins. Much larger than your sins. The Bible says, Thou art wearied in the greatness of thy way. Yet saidest thou not, there is no hope. Thou hast found the life of thine hand, therefore thou wast not grieved. Because you have found Jesus Christ, and you know that his sacrifice has saved you, you can read the headlines. You can listen to the bad news every day. And not be worried. But you know that Jesus has saved you from all of this. And he will bring you through it in the end. Whatever problems may weigh you down or weigh other people down, you have found the way of life. God has said to us in Christ, I have satiated the weary soul. I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Just as Jesus gave joy and life to those 4,000 people that he fed, when they had given up hope, there was no hope anywhere. Everything was bleak. Jesus turned it all around, just like that. So he does with all of us. Jesus said, Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Many years ago, there was a teenager. He had been born lame, couldn't walk. He had no feeling in his feet or in his legs. All he could do was sit in a chair. And so he sat day after day, season after season, looking out his window onto the street. And there he'd see the other boys and girls as he grew up, and they were growing up, and they were all running and jumping and having fun out uh, in the street and so forth, and he saw them. And he was bitter. And he blamed God. God, how could you do this to me? Why am I not like the other boys? Why can't I walk and run and jump and play? And he was sour. He had a sour disposition. He looked upon God and life with sorrow and sadness and bitterness, and this bitterness came out in his actions and in his words towards everyone. He hated God. He hated his life. Then one day, a friend came in and gave him a book. It's called The Wide, Wide World. So he read the book. When he started reading the book, he was, as this text says, he was weary and sorrowful. But when he finished the book, he was not. Why was that? Well, the book, The Wide, Wide World, told him why the world was the way it was that it's a bad world. It's a terrible world. It's a world filled with sorrow and weariness. And it's not because of God. 
It's because of man and man's sin. Because man sins. Because man ignores God and disobeys God and goes away from God constantly. That's the problem with the world. And so this young man, as he read this book, he became aware of sin, and he became aware of his own sin. And he became penitent, and he became sorrowful, and he saw in himself his sin. So he read more of the book. And this book led him to see that, that this isn't the end, though. This isn't the way it will always be. This book talked about Jesus Christ, who is God who came down from heaven and died for our sins. And so this young man, gradually, by the power of the Holy Ghost, came to believe in Jesus as God and Savior. And his weariness was satiated, and his sorrow went away, and he was replenished. He was still lame, but now when he looked out the window, he saw, instead of ugliness, he saw beauty. He saw the beautiful sky, and he saw the green earth. And when he saw the other boys and girls playing, he said, it's okay. It's all right. I know this is the way God wants me to be. And I know I'll never walk, but it's okay, because God loves me, and I love him. And he must work all things for my good. And someday I will walk, and I'll walk in heaven. And I'll walk in heaven forever. And this life will seem like just a short dream. And that's the way it is with true Christianity. God says in Christ, I have satiated the weary soul. I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.